now I want to shift from the sea to the land and, you know, move closer to your part of the world, Appalachia. I was hired by a foundation to study the effect of mountaintop removal and valley fill soil loss and look at the overall ecological impact. And the, the small team who was working with me and myself, when we began to look at the million and a half, a million and a quarter to a million and a half acres of totally devastated land in one of the most magnificent temperate forests in the world, or in some people's minds, the most magnificent in terms of its biodiversity, was literally being destroyed in our time. And I said to the foundation, I can't take it anymore. My staff is depressed, I'm depressed. Doom watch is not what I want to do. Can I look for solutions to the problem? And there you can see, we flew over in a small plane and photographed all this stuff. It breaks your heart. This is what typically happens. They hydro seed uh, with some exotic plant and they just aren't taken. If you look carefully at that slide, you can see all the erosion. There is virtually no diversity. It's, it's almost a single species environment. And so we said, is there any way that we can reclaim the rock into soil? Is there any way at all? We looked at the, the wonderful work being done in Wise West Virginia and other places on reforestation. And the, uh, I guess it was called the Powell River Project, I can't remember exactly. They were learning how to put trees onto the landscape and to have them survive. But what we found is that as brilliant as the work was, they were requiring seven, several feet of fill for the young tree seedlings to survive. In other words, there wouldn't be enough organic matter anywhere to take a million and a quarter acres and put a layer of soil and organic matter on top of it in order to reforest it. What was needed was something much more radical. We came across the idea of planting warm season grasses, which were perennials. They had to be perennials. They had to have a proven ability to be able to get established in very difficult environment. And so what we did is we experimented with a number of perennial warm season grasses. One was big blue stem, which simply couldn't survive. That's the genus Andropogon. And then we went to switchgrass, which is, as many of you know, used as a source of, of biofuels and also as a source of, of restoration ability. And also the Atlantic coastal panic grass, again, both from the same genus. Those two species managed to survive on the bare rock provided we provided our buscular fungi and biochar and half of the area was treated with a regular fertilizer and the other half was simply left with just the fungi and the charcoal and uh, the grasses. After both of the systems worked well, the first year, the fertilizer one was slightly ahead in terms of pounds per acre. And by the second year, the system without the commercial fertilizer had pretty much caught up and was becoming quite productive. This is a, this is a photograph of the, of, of the test site. What it said to us is that we can now create soils on these difficult surfaces. Then what we would have to do is find an economic landscape that would allow anybody to want to do over a million acres of restoration. So I'm just going to walk through what is kind of a first pass. 
This is year one. For no particularly good reason, I sort of settled on a, a, a thousand acre block as maybe the, the working unit. But here the idea was to begin with the warm season grasses, begin to harvest them, create biofuels and biochar, and also begin to work on cleaning up some of the slurry, which we had already started doing that in my laboratory in Vermont. Uh, so this is the beginning of it, uh, block pattern. And uh, then the next one is eight years later. Now we're in a position eight years later, we're still producing the biofuels and the biochar, but we're now in a position where we can begin to create an agroforestry landscape with trees highly adapted to the region. In the book, I tell a story about what the region would actually look like in eight years time. But it's being diversified. And as you can see, uh, but it's still insular in the sense that it's treating itself. It has an agro eco park now. By year 16, it is also got conservation elements. The slurry ponds have been moved over to aquaculture, but the yellow arrow in the top is the important, is that this system is now underwriting physically, technologically, and financially a future restoration site. So it's expanding outward. As I began to think about that, there were two things, and I, and I admit these are idealistic thoughts. One is there has to be a way in which the people of Appalachia can re regain their land. In other words, almost like a new homestead act. Particularly the people who were involved in somewhere with this restoration effort. In other words, the re habitation of the landscape should be a goal. And so this is institutional succession. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that the types of institutions on the landscape have to change with time. And that for early stages, there are early kinds of institutions, middle stages, other kinds of institutions, and later stages, more highly evolved social institutions. And that in this way, we get past the old cliches of left and right and move to a ecological successional vision of, um, of inhabiting the landscape. So just walking up this, this branch system um, and uh, Again, the details of this are, are in the book. At the early stages, it's philanthropy and governments that are bringing together NGOs, and it's the cafe, if you will, period where people are trying to figure out how it happens. And then from there, land trusts are beginning to learn with philanthropic help uh, the acquisition of the lands. And then the early stages of the restoration would be a combination of entrepreneurial types with also academic types who are trying to find the best methodology. And then finally, there are very a diversity of structures of corporations of certain kinds of cooperatives. And then eventually the organizations that were uh, land trusts can transform themselves into financial institutions, which can then fund the whole thing. And then finally, in the end, it's a complicated mix, which includes the idea of, of natural resource cooperatives, which are in, in, in a number of places throughout the U.S. and Canada, work very effectively to be inclusive to provide buying power, to educate, to create a larger framework and to, to diversify. So I don't know whether this is the right model. Oh, I should also add there's a new Homestead Act in this, which would provide the access to the land for those who had earned that um, 
earned that right. My last story is of unpacking the ecological toolbox is a rather unusual one. This is the Sinai Desert. A group of friends of mine with whom I work, they're in Holland, are called the Weathermakers. And they have been studying climate and how its influence on ecology and how it might there might be certain situations that climate could be improved. The Sinai Desert, which of course we all know from the biblical story and biblical stories, the Old Testament stories, they discovered was a weather crucible. And by weather crucible, I mean when it had, was forested, when it was covered with vegetation, that it drew into the region, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, monsoon rains and monsoon winds that kept the land green and verdant. That's what they found out. And one of the ways, and this, is, this, this story really, really excites me, one of the ways they found how, what it was like three, four, and 5,000 years ago was they were able to obtain the, the ship's logs from Arab traders who the wind direction and the monsoons and the detailed observations is what allowed them to basically uh, sail all the way from China to East Africa. And it turns out that by looking at those records, they were able to find a correlation between the deforestation and the weakening of the power of the Sinai to bring rains to the region and to influence a larger area. So the question then was, is it possible to re-green a desert? Is, is, is this insanity or is it possible? And you're looking at a photograph right now of an area in China called the Los Plateau, L-O-E-S-S, -S, Plateau. It is a vast area that has a very, very fine sands, which were blowing up into the air and were the scaffolding for the smog hundreds of miles away in Beijing and the other cities of China. They were literally choking because of the fine dust swirling off this, getting into the atmosphere, and connecting up with other industrial pollutants and creating hell. 20 years ago, and this is a very depopulated area, as you would expect, 20 years ago, the China, Chinese said, we are going to green it. And 20 years later, they did it. I've met the Chinese on the ground leaders of this project, and can verify what you're looking at. For those of you who want to know more, the, the biologist filmmaker John Liu, L-I-U, created a movie called Green Gold. See it. It will give you courage that whether we're talking about South Africa or Western Australia or the Southwestern US or wherever, that regreening is possible. One of the things that I did for the Sinai project was to create a, an eco machine, an oasis eco machine for the Sinai. It is just one of a number of projects we're putting together. First of all, the oasis eco machine is housed within a geodesic structure, a greenhouse structure, 60 feet in diameter. And there you can see it there. And they're operated so that their vents are wide open during the day and closed at night. But the key to this technology, and there, there is one of the prototype domes that we developed. Okay, now this is the key part. There's no fresh water, but there is seawater. So the idea is we take those big clear tanks you've seen before, and we fill them up with seawater and aquatic life. These are translucent tanks. 
And again, the same routine. Vents are open during the day and closed at night. And this is the kind of tank that would be inside it. In the early days, we used to manufacture our own. Now they can be bought. Okay. Now here's the key. Salt water in the tanks. At night, with the dome closed, it gets very cold on the outside and stays very warm on the inside. And so the tanks weep condensation and the fresh water condenses on the roof at night. In other words, it's, there's a desalinization is taking place. And then the person comes along in the morning, and I kid you not, they drum on the dome with their hands and it rains inside for three or four minutes every day. And so you basically have a morning freshwater shower. And then inside these tanks, because you want an economy right away, is you start growing valuable seafoods. And that includes the, the clams, scallops, oysters, microalgae, fishes, edible seaweeds, shrimp, and so on. All stuff that we've done. And this then is the foundation for an economic basis to have this. And then inside, because this water is weeping down the sides of the tanks, eventually you're going to end up, and there has to be a rotational scheme with salt, with the fresh water being used elsewhere. But in here, we're pl planting perennial rooted crops, crops like fig trees, the un really uncanny ability to get their roots down into deep areas. And then also vine food crops, which are on scaffoldings over the tanks, so that there again is some more short-term diversification of the economy. There's the dome and there's a fig tree drooping out over the fish tanks and the figs, uh, you can see the big figs in the foreground. And then finally, 20 or so people come along and pick up the dome after three or four years, lift it up and move it to a new site to repeat the cycle. And what this is, is in other words, you're leaving the ecology behind on its own and acting as a kind of beachhead for other life to come and join it. Imagine if you will, a fleet of these Oasis Eco Machine sort of marching across the desert, leaving these behind them. And uh, it looks as though we're going to start on this project, possibly in the very southern part of the Sinai, down near where Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt kind of come together, and see if we can make this happen. I should add through ending that this is not the only project going on. We've been very much involved in trying to evaluate and study the potential salt tolerant plants which could be planted directly into the desert there. The other thing that is being considered, and this boggles the imagination, is that all of the soil that used to be on the mountains has flown down through a series of rivers to a lake, a large lake at the eastern end of the Mediterranean called Lake Bardawil. It is now only a meter deep. 8,000 years ago, it was close to 100 feet deep. The sediments all ended up, or not all of them, but most of them ended up in Bardawil. And one of the world's largest dredging companies, a Belgian company, is figuring out ways that they can dredge and use those dredge spoils and salt tolerant plants to begin to plant the valleys and hills up, up high. And, uh, and there's even some discussion about the possibility of using um, dirigibles, you know, inflated balloon types uh, aircraft that would then deposit the soils up into the hills and the mountains. Whether that actually happens or not is pure conjecture at this time. But what's interesting is that there is a, a real sense that if there's 
ever going to be peace in the Middle East. It won't come through, you know, military activities. It will more likely come through large scale restoration like this, because then there will be work, work for lots of people. That's kind of the hope by the, uh, the, the European who are working on this with, with Egypt. And we'll just see what happens. But I'll just end with this. If you look up commonlands.org, I think, or Commonlands NL, it's a Dutch organization. They are creating entities, large areas in Spain and to a lesser extent in Southern Africa and Western Australia, where literally tens of thousands of people are going to be trained. They're already in the thousands in restoration ecology and going to different parts of the world and regreening it. And if there's any chance of sequestering carbon on a realistic scale, I think it's going to be through a worldwide movement. So I'm going to wrap up here. One of the things that's been wonderful for me this morning is to know that I'm talking to people who not only get this stuff, but are doing this stuff. And my hat's off to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.